Good afternoon. Uh, I'm David Wilco, and it is my pleasure to introduce this afternoon's speaker, Jody Hilton. Jody is president of the Yellowstone Yukon Initiative. Uh, Jody is a conservation biologist by training. She received her doctorate at uh, UC Berkeley and for the uh, Princeton uh, students in the crowd, she is also Andy Dobson's first academic grandchild. Because her advisor uh, was Adina Marylander, who was one of Andy Dobson's first graduate students. Wow. So, um, Jody's work over the years has one thing as a constant, which is that she has always been interested in the conservation of large connected landscapes for the benefit of biodiversity and people. So after receiving her doctorate, she became the executive director of the North American Program for the Wildlife Conservation Society. And in that capacity, she led uh, a number of multi-organizational -organ initiatives to address issues of resource extraction and habitat fragmentation with respect to uh, the United States and Canada. And in particular, her uh, leadership of that program led to the expansion of some important national parks in Canada, as well as the first ever US federal program to protect the migratory path of a mammal, in this case, uh, pronghorns in the Northern Rockies. In 2017, you became president of the uh, Yellowstone to Yukon Initiative which is a uh, marvelously ambitious effort uh, focused on connecting and protecting wildlife <laughs> habitat, literally from Yellowstone to the Yukon. So it is a pleasure to welcome to Princeton, Jody Hilty. Thank you. It is a pleasure and an honor to be here today. Um, on Friday, the federal government of Canada announced something huge. The third uh, uh, indigenous-led protected area announcement. So what this means is that there are two First Nations, the British Columbia government and the federal government came together in an effort to rescue caribou and announced a complex of about 700,000 hectares of protected areas and other designations to bring back caribou. I almost cried. Why? Because this is huge. This is really, really huge. One, it's really important because culturally, these First Nations, as Chief Roland Wilson would say, he wants to eat caribou before he dies. Caribou are their brethren. Caribou are the sustenance. Caribou are their culture. There aren't enough for them to hunt. They voluntarily stopped hunting them in 1990. They are in a historic moment looking to restore these caribou. This is the third example in the Wai'a Wai region alone where indigenous-led conservation is going forward. This is huge, too, because it recognizes the United Nations declarations on the rights of indigenous people. So you can look at the northernmost part of the Yellowstone to Yukon region called the Peel. It's an area the size of Nova Scotia. And again, in a tri-government uh, agreement, three First Nations, the Yukon government and the federal government, they've got 83% of that area will be protected. And then a little bit south into a place that affects us here in, in the United States, the headwaters of the Columbia River, a mountain range called the Purcells, they've just announced a new indigenous protected area in a place called Jumbo or Kotmuk. This is a seed change, so watch it happen. I'll talk a little bit more about it, but I just wanted to share with you, this is really live. Things are happening in the wide Rai region. So, Let's talk today. I'm going to just give you an overview of who Y to Y is. I'm going to move back a little bit and talk about some of the global perspectives and why they matter for Y to Y. 
What does it really take to reconnect habitat? What are those solutions? And what are our next challenges and opportunities going forward? So I'm going to take you to my backyard. It's the Rockies. It's the most, arguably, the most intact mountain ecosystem in the world, right? It still has all of the large carnivores, all of the large hooved animals, and it's a rapidly changing landscape today. We have a local responsibility, and I argue a global responsibility to keep it that way. So how do we go about doing that, right? When tourists are coming in more numbers than ever before, Yellowstone, Banff, Waterton Lakes. Waterton Lakes had to close its gates last year. They literally couldn't get any more people into the park. What do we do about that? Well, what I say is people love parks. We need more. So the Yellowstone to Yukon vision, I'll talk a little bit later about some of the history about it, but it's really about making sure that we reconnect places that aren't connected and that we sustain connectivity and functionality of that system for the long term. So our vision is about this interconnected system of wildlands and waters, right? And that this harmonizes the needs of people and nature. Can we have thriving communities that respect nature? So the organization that I run is the only organization that's dedicated to conservation of this region as a whole. And there are two fundamental principles that the founders um, uh, sort of laid out that we still go forward with today. One is science and knowledge. Notice the knowledge because science is one form of knowledge. Indigenous knowledge is another form of knowledge. Both can be valuable, and we're really working hard to work together with those two forms of knowledge. The second is collaboration. My organization is 27 people. Do you think we can work across 2,000 miles by ourselves? No. We have worked since, for 25 years, we've worked with more than 450 identified partners. It, I, we never do anything by ourselves because it takes a village to advance conservation. And I'll give you some examples. But let's go to the global level for a second. I want to take you on a little journey. For those of you who are young, you might not know, but there were wars, wars over what a protected area is. What is the definition of protected area? And ultimately, after many, many years of healthy discussion and pulling back and forth, we came up with the Dudley et al. definition. That is great. I can tell you that even last year when I was in London, there were folks saying, we need to revise that because, you know, in England, maybe we need to include backyard gardens and roadways and things like that because we don't have any protected areas otherwise. So people are still trying to change that definition, but it's a strong definition. So I want to leave you all with a story of hope, and it's going to start right here. Protected areas really weren't on the map 100 years ago, right? The only thing that you might be able to see if you have great eyes is Yellowstone here and Banff, right? It wasn't something that we conceptualized. Even by the 1920s, not a lot was happening. By the 1940s, we see a little bit over in Africa, and we see a little bit more in North America expanding even more, mostly in those continents. And then all of a sudden, we start to really see things happening in Asia, a little bit in Europe, and in uh, South America. By 2000, again, a, a massive increase. And today, what's really exciting, and I'm going to go backwards because I want you to see the blue. Look at the oceans. We're finally addressing the oceans. Are we there yet? Of course not. There's a biodiversity crisis. We have more to do, right? But this is a story of hope that we can make change if we put our minds to it and if there's great science behind it. However, and remember I'm a corridor, wildlife corridor ecologist, if you put things in bottles and you expect them, you isolate them, do you think that they're going to operate well? Well, in most cases, most protected areas aren't big enough. So how do we turn around this biodiversity crisis? Well, there are people like E.O. Wilson who say, 
we've got to have more, right? And with, of course, some caveats about where, how, and all that. And that's one thing that, that Y2Y is engaging in. So we are the, the chair of the IUCN WCPA task force called Beyond Aichi Targets. So for those of you who don't know, which would make sense, because the United States is one of two countries in the world that didn't sign the Convention for Biodiversity. Somalia is the other country, but they didn't have a verifiable government at the time. So anyway, all the other countries in the world are aiming by 2020 for a number of biodiversity targets. In October, they're going to meet in China, the, the conference of parties, all but the US and Somalia, um, to define what the next protected area targets will be by 2030. And so um, I won't talk a lot about this right now, but um, that's a really important and exciting conversation that's happening at the global world. There's a lot of science being produced in preparation for it. What does nature need? So I mentioned the Peel River watershed. So um, you can see it up here in the corner. There's the Peel. This is the area that I mentioned it will be 83% in new protected areas, indigenous led conservation, OK? <coughs> this is really exciting. Canada, the, the <coughs> prime minister committed to 25% oceans and terrestrial areas by 2025, um, and 30 by 30. So we're trying hard. We're pushing hard. OK, but in addition to having protected areas, remember, we got to get away from isolation. And so we need corridors. I love this map. This is on the way from my home in Banff over to the Skeena watershed. This says it all. Lots of animals need to move, and they need to move across this road, and the corridors need to be really, really wide, 185 kilometers. It's perfect. But the reality is, is unlike protected areas, corridors haven't really, or connectivity, ecological connectivity, really hasn't been defined and agreed upon. In the science literature, everybody argues about what it should be called, what, it, what works, what doesn't work. In the sort of conservation politics arena, it's even more fuzzy. So is it for whales? Is it for butterflies? Is it for salmonids? What is it for? Is it maybe for the Russian river and maintaining uh, river systems? Or is it for migratory movements, animals that move from one location to another and then return? What is connectivity? And or, it's also the subject of almost every review paper on climate change with the, the summarizing that in the end, we need to maintain connectivity so that plants and animals might have the opportunity to move through time and space given climate change. Whatever it is, it's being implemented. I really love this slide. This is the World Business Council on Sustainable Development. Shell's in there, Nissan, IBM, uh, Toyota, major, major companies around the world without any of the benefit of conservation biologists decided to call for landscape connectivity. Why? Because it's good for business. That's amazing. Now you can look at countries like Costa Rica. Costa Rica is 23% in protected areas. Why? Because it's good for their economy. Their ecotourism-based economy. Look at this map of corridors and connectivity and protected areas. You can also go to Bhutan. Bhutan perhaps is the most assertive in terms of nature conservation. I love this. I was told that it's because of their gross national happiness index that the then king declared that they needed to maintain nature. So he maintained 53% of it and connected it, as science said. Pretty powerful, a global leader. So within the Y to Y region, um, for those of you who know, Banff is one of the first national parks. There's a town. Um, in, in uh, Banff National Park, as well as the park itself. And the town is in the middle of a valley. So there's this, you can see this river coming through. Normally, wildlife would move through the river valley, but the town was kind of like a plug in the middle of it. So this is the first published uh, restoration of a wildlife corridor in any of the scientific journals, and it's about this corridor. So let me tell you the story. In the beginning, they had put a horse barn, a buffalo paddock, airfields, a cadet camp, and a hotel in the middle of the corridor. And um, they realized that they didn't have wildlife movement going around the park. And so they went ahead and they removed everything. Actually, they've now removed the cadet camp. And as a result of that, what you can see is that 
Uh, the blue lines are pre-restoration and the red lines are post-restoration. There's perhaps a better way to show it. The blue, really you see most of the blue lines just stop right there, whereas the red you see massive increases in movement. We can restore connectivity for specific species, maybe even for ecosystems. Okay. So let me go back to the global scale one more time. Why would Y2Y, a small organization that's working in a mountain range in North America, work at the global scale? Well, there's two reasons. One I mentioned, which is the 2030 biodiversity targets. And the other is that part of our mission is to shift the global paradigm from protected areas as the mechanism for conservation to protected areas as an essential component of large landscape, seascape, riverscape conservation. Right? How can we get to that? And so that's why we're engaging at the global level because it enables us to do what we need to do right in the Y2Y region. So in the spring, how many of you are aware of the World Conservation Congress happening in Marseille? Okay, well there's a big deal. So if you can get there, go. It's super exciting. There's like two or 3,000 people that go to this thing. Um, and it's run by the largest NGO in the world and make you know, that doesn't mean it's the most effective, but it means that it is an important NGO. It's really volunteer run, right? So many scientists around the world engage their time. They're the people who, who manage the protected area database. They're the people who manage the red list for endangered species. It's, again, a really important uh, entity. All right. So what I'm going to talk about is why to rise roles as part of the connectivity specialist group as vice chair and is leading the, the new guidelines on what ecological connectivity might be. Okay? So guidelines aren't the same as getting to an agreement on protected, you know, on the definition of uh, corridors, but they're a step. So I would expect if we continue on this trajectory that maybe in five to ten years time we might have global agreement on what connectivity is. But we've gone forward, and uh, this, this document will, um, uh, will be presented at, in Marseille. Um, uh, it's on the conserving connectivity through ecological networks and corridors. How, what are the, so if you have protected areas, and I'll talk about this a little bit more, what, what's in between those protected areas? But first, let's talk about the difference between corridors or connectivity and Protected areas. I won't talk about OECMs because that's a new designation and you can look it up yourselves or talk to me later about this. But basically it's another way of getting to cons conservation of biodiversity. So protected areas and OECMs have to conserve biodiversity. They could conserve connectivity, but they don't have to. Whereas ecological corridors, they can conserve biodiversity, but they also don't have to. There can be human activities, and there often are human activities in areas that are important for connectivity, but they must conserve connectivity. So let's talk about that a little bit more. Now remember, the global world and the IUCN world is not just conservation biologists. It is lawyers, politicians, and many, many other uh, specialties. So how, I just want to give you just a very high sense of how this actually moves forward. So the first thing that I want to tell you about is that to, we have to get to a global common language, okay? This means going out for consultation around the world. One of the important groups, as an example, is the Conven United Nations Convention for Migratory Species. So we had several meetings with them in Bonn, Germany, and we came up with a definition. There weren't any conservation biologists in the room from CMS. So they wanted a very high level definition. Unimpeded movement of species and flow of natural processes that sustain life on Earth. Now you can imagine that my conservation biology friends might keel over when they read that definition. So what we've done is we've tiered the definitions. So in order for the conservation scientists to agree, we came up with a definition about populations, genes, uh, you know, uh, propagules, et cetera, right? to satisfy both, because everybody has to see themselves in this document. This is called conservation politics. Now, on that 53-page document that we wrote, we had no less than 150 pages of input. If you want to get through the IUCN process, you have to respond to every 
single comment in detail. This is how you get to consensus. So for those of you who think that you can do conservation without engaging with many people, you can't. And the bigger you go, the larger scale you go to the global scale, the more you engage people. And these were comments from every continent in the world. So anyway, we are moving forward. And it will be with marine, uh, 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 terrestrial and also riverscapes, um, all seeing themselves in that definition, which is no small feat because the marine people wanted to do their own thing at first, and we've slowly helped everyone to see themselves in that page. And there will no doubt be more dialogue, so any of you who end up going to Marseille, it'll be fun. So how does this relate back to why to why? So now I'm going to quickly just tell you a little bit of the inception story. In the early 1990s and late 80s, we started to, we had the advent of GPS collars, like the one shown on this animal here, Pluey the wolf. And we started to see movements like this. This wolf started just south of the central Rockies. She went across two provinces, three states, 30 different jurisdictions, Native American reservations, public lands, private lands of all different kinds. And she and her pups were legally harvested just south of Kootenai National Park. So what did she show us? She showed us that while we have these parks, which are really important, they're not big enough for animals like her to be sustained on the landscape. There's another way to look at this. So why do I is overlaid on this map that uh, La Liberty and Ripple, Ripple did, looking at um, the hooved, and, hooved animals and large carnivores. And what you can see is that across North America, we've lost a lot of the range of these hooved animals and these large carnivores. And one of the only places that they remain is in the Waidawai region. We can look at this another way. The logo of Waidawai is a grizzly bear. Um, how many of you knew that grizzly bears once roamed in Mexico? Isn't that cool? Yeah, but then by 1922, there were these little isolated patches of, of grizzly bears left in the brown. Inevitably, if they don't get shot, at some point you'll have 10 individuals, and there won't be a reproductive female, and they'll go extinct. And they did, all but this Yellowstone population, which is genetically much less robust than the northern, more northern population that's left in the red. Our job is to reconnect them but I'll come back to that. So the other thing that the founders realized is that at its coarsest level, climate change scientists say, expand protected areas, connect them, and reduce stressors. And that is what Y2Y is trying to do. Now over here, we're, we're over here on the, you know, in Canada. It's still nice and cold there. I went skiing yesterday before I got on the plane. I don't know where you all are. You don't have to tell me now. But, you know. Things are changing. So the question is, how do you create connectivity at the scale of Y to Y? So one of the things that we've done is um, in many places, and I won't talk about the breadth of our work, but we're going to talk a little bit about using grizzly bears because they're a known umbrella species. And what do I mean by that? There's a student, uh, Robin Stinwig, who worked at, uh, got her P his PhD at the University of Montana. And he looked at how well do grizzly bears represent 19 other species. And it turns out pretty darn well. In other words, if you get it right for grizzly bears, you get it right for a lot of other species. Um, and not all of them. There's still going to be some animals that you're going to have to do, um, and plants, that, that won't be represented in this. But it gives you a good general map. So I'm going to tell you a little bit, just a downscaled version of how this actually looks when you try and take a mess of science at that scale as well as a more fine scale that I'll show you in a second to get this work done. So first look at Duck Lake linkage, Kid, Link, Kid, Kid Creek, and Yak. Those are three linkages that we wanted to restore. We did. But also, um, look here at this isolated population of bears, this one and this one. Here's the science on the isolation of those populations. So when you move forward to do this, you have to get good science. So this is Michael Proctor. You can see here's an isolated population. Here's another isolated population. Here's another isolated population. This is what once used to be a continuous grizzly bear population that genetically was indistinguishable. 
now because of roads and development, we can actually see the genetic markers that they're isolated. If I, you were able to look at this map more closely, you'd see a lot of this is defined by roads and the development that's associated to roads. So Highway 3 right here is a known barrier for grizzly bears and for wolverines. I won't talk about it, but I'm, what's really exciting is BC just committed to a road crossing structures here based on years of science that have been going on. Um, but let's go forward. How do you get a transboundary region to change this genetic pattern of grizzly bears? It requires collaboration, getting everybody to play in the same sandbox and agree on the same vision. Okay? And it requires going back to the scientists, because although we know that they're not connected, we didn't know where the important connectivity areas are. And so Michael Proctor and his colleagues helped us by identifying these yellow areas, which are best areas for connectivity. Again, using uh, field work, very hard field work, and, um, and years and years of data. Okay, So then we get down to, well, here's a parcel. And the grizzly bear biologists say, right here, this is where the grizzly bears could cross. It's not pristine. It's actually an area that's being, at the moment when we bought it, was being used for agriculture. But it's the only place that's left. And so we bought it, and we've restored it. And in fact, we've done a lot of purchasing of these areas over the years. In fact, we purchased 188,000 acres with our land trust partners cost us about $8 million, right, um, for, for just our piece, leveraged $140 million. OK? So in doing that, we've restored three wildlife corridors. And I'll tell you what I mean about that in a second. We also were able to get 500,000 acres of core uh, habitat um, res you know, uh, closed off from roads and restored. Um, there's a fourth corridor that we're working on right now, right on the panhandle of Idaho, right where it touches the BC border. We've, um, we're working on a restoration project. And then we also had to work on coexistence, right? Um, this means putting electric fences around chicken coops, beehives, everything else that might attract bears towards humans. So what happens when we do that? Well, so by tackling lands, roads, and people, the grizzly bear population on the U.S. side in the Cabinet Yak went from 10 grizzly bears to more than 60. Our goal is 100, the collective collaborative goal. We're getting there. I actually don't think we'll get all the way there, though, because bears are starting to disperse. And that kind of means that it's getting a little crowded for them. So we'll see if they actually get to 100. We might have been wrong in our, in our estimates. But this is the really neat thing. Oftentimes, when you're doing conservation, you don't really know the, wh whether you've ultimately affected it, right? You've bought the land, you hope that things come, but here you can see here's, the, here's one of the linkages that we restored. Um, right up here, this is the, the Idaho area that we're working on restoring right now. We're already seeing increased movement here, and we've got bears moving right here. Bears actually have walked across the properties that we've bought. It's cool, it's very rare do you get that satisfaction of knowing that your conservation objectives actually contributed to restoration. OK, so that's one scale. I showed you a really small project. We and others are working across the y to y region. But how can you actually say that a large vision like connecting and protecting habitat across the Yellowstone to Yukon region makes a difference? And so, a number of us here set forward to answer that question. Because a lot of, we were starting to get pushback from politicians saying, oh, it's a cool idea, but like, does it really, you know, nothing happens at that scale, so why do we need this? Why do we need to buy into it? And so what we did was first, we compared the rates of protected area gain <coughs> in the Y to Y region to other regions. We also looked at the, the private lands conservation growth and wildlife crossing structures, like the one shown right here. Animals actually cross that. Um, and um, we also then tested for mainstreaming of the wide, wide vision. So I'm going to walk you through each of those. Okay. 
So one of the challenges is that there's nothing, there, there hasn't really been a replicate or a control of the Y to Y region, right? And so we have to really uh, be creative about coming up with ways to really figure out whether the vision had a difference or not. So the first thing I'm going to show you is just the trends of increasing protected areas just in the Y to Y region. You saw it globally. I showed you those maps. But what's happening in the Y to Y region? So over here, this is the Banff Yellowstone. You know, we kind of continued forward. We got to the Rachel Carson area, and we saw an uptick in protected areas. Right here, this red line, this is when y, the Y to Y vision came to be, and we saw another uptick. Well, OK, maybe that had to do with the Y to Y vision, but maybe not, right? It's very hard to tell. So um, one way to you know, so one way to look at this is just okay. Well, we've increased, and I'm going to just show, tell you right now. I'm saying more than 50 percent because right now we're in the final stages of, of uh, writing up this paper before we submit it, and we're arguing about uh, techniques. So I'm going to just keep it at more than 50 percent. <laughs> um, um, so you can see that the protected areas here have increased substantially you know, over the last 25 years. Okay, well that's great. You can see it visually too. But now, what we wanted to do was say, okay, within this region, including the Northwest Territories, Yukon, British Columbia, Alberta, Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington, but outside of the boundaries, what happened in the same jurisdiction? Okay, so that area is about uh, 5 million kilometers squared, and um, they had about 25% growth in, in all of those other regions. And the interesting thing there is if you really were to dissect it, which we did, but it, the, there's a place called the Great Bear Rainforest, which is another large landscape initiative. And a lot of the growth that happened happened because of that large landscape initiative, which actually supports the idea that large landscape visions matter. So let's offer another counterfactual. So we've got this IPBS report, and right here it shows that, well, North America is at 11% protected areas. It's not doing great. Um, but also, look at, what's, look, at, look at this right here, right? And look at the declining rates of protection. And in, in fact, if you look in the last couple of years, we've actually had a profound, the most Degazetting of protected areas in, in the United States ever in the history of the U.S. Um, and there's been a long history of degazetting. Um, even Banff National Park was significantly re reduced in size when, they, when the feds moved power of crown lands to the provinces. Um, so, okay, so there's declining rates of protection. What I want you to notice, though, is that the dates aren't exactly the same. So it becomes, it's harder um, to get down to whether or not um, this is exactly the same time period as Y to Y. But we can still sort of point to this real uptick, um, and that's in the Y to Y region, versus a, a downward trend across the rest of North America. So that's another suggestion that, in fact, having a large vision can make a difference, right? So protected, protected areas grew at greater than 50%. Um, they grew more than double the rate compared to North America. And the trend is opposite, meaning increasing in the Y to Y region versus North America, which is decreasing. So we're arguing that that's strong counterfactual support for the growth of protected areas. Protected areas aren't everything. So let's talk about some of the other pieces. Private lands and road crossing structures. OK, so I talked just about the region that was transboundary, where Y to Y actually had a hand, actually gave dollars um, and other kinds of support to buying critical private lands. Um, actually, overall in the region, Y to Y has contributed to more than 490,000 acres of private land going into easement or being outright purchased specifically either for core habitat or for corridors. There's a lot more land in the Y to Y region that has been conserved, uh, private land that has been conserved 
by other entities, which Y2Y had no identifiable hand in. Just to be really clear on that. If we really limited it and were conservative. Okay? Um, we also can look at wildlife crossing structures, right? This area has 116 overpasses and underpasses, which are specifically dedicated for the wildlife to get safely across roads. There are more in this region than any other region in the world. So let's look at this. So here's one in Banff National Park. This is also the most well-studied crossing structure system in Banff of any place in the world. There are over, over 40 wildlife crossing structures. Tons of research, a lot of it led by Tony Clevenger and his colleagues, show that these work. Really interesting stuff that I won't be able to get into, like it takes animals a while to learn. Right? The curve of animals using this has grown over time and finally started to plateau. The number of different species using this at the beginning is very different than it is today. This is important stuff. Um, they also uh, were able to prove things like demographic connectivity. So if in Banff National Park they hadn't invested in these $3 million overpasses, we wouldn't have had demographic connectivity for grizzly bears. So what do I mean by that? Males are willing to move underneath the road. Females with cubs won't. They only, so far, have used overpasses. So if you want true genetic connectivity and demographic connectivity, you really need, in this system, for this species to have both. Uh, this is a really ex cool example. It's between the U.S. Glacier National Park and Missoula. The Flathead Indian Reservation, which is the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes, they have a really important reservation there. Um, when my husband was a lawyer for them, you could see the bumper stickers that said, Pray for me, I drive Highway 93, the most dangerous road in Montana. So, of course, the Department of Transportation came in and said, okay, we're going to twin it. We're going to double the roads. We're going to put in Jersey barriers, which are those big, I don't think it has anything to do with New Jersey, but, you know, uh, the cement barriers that make it impossible for wildlife to get across. <coughs> and you know what the tribe said? <coughs> no way. So for five years, they fought. And at the end of five years, the Department of Transportation signed a memorandum of understanding, recognizing the cultural heritage, including wildlife. And they put in, uh, so far, 43 wildlife crossing structures, including this overpass. By the way, there were kids out there, which kids always make the world better. They went out and they they, every year and they collected about 500 dead painted turtles on the roadside, turtles that were trying to migrate every year. And it made the headlines every year. Um, and it made it really hard for the Department of Transportation to ignore that. That became, by the way, the Department of Transportation in Montana just touted this as the best thing ever after they finally decided they wanted to do it. There's more to do, however. There were six bears killed this year, grizzly bears, on this road. So they finished a big chunk of it, but they didn't finish the last part. And the tribes are now, once again, cajoling the Department of Transportation to do it right. This one is about the path of the pronghorn. David Wilcove mentioned this. It's in, in Wyoming. It's uh, part of the first federally designated um, uh, wildlife migration corridor in the country. Story behind that, um, we didn't know whether pronghorn would use that overpass. We had studied this. Uh, Joel Berger and John Beckman had been studying this for a long time. And um, we had a staff person out there, and they didn't yet have these fences up. And he was watching the construction, and the, the, the pronghorn were over here, and they were piling up. And it was getting dark, and the workers were going home, and Jeff was about to pack up his stuff. And he said he turned around and he watched this one individual start to walk across and run back, start to walk across. And then 250 animals ran across an unfinished overpass. And we all breathed a sigh of relief. Kind of a neat story. You can actually get online during the fall and watch the migration because there's, there's a camera there. So this is the, you know, so uh, overpasses and underpasses don't work unless you have fencing. So there's now about 140 kilometers of highways in the y to y region that are fenced, too. Are we done yet? No. But are we on a trend toward getting 
the departments of transportation to normalize safe crossing for wildlife on busy roads? Yeah. So it turns out about 100 cars per hour is a barrier for, for animals like grizzly bears. So it's a pretty good marker. You can tell when you need to start paying attention to that. Okay. So now we get to the fourth test of the Y to Y vision, the test for mainstreaming evidence. What do I mean by that? So one of the ways we looked at this is how often is Y to Y in these various types of written um, science or sort of somewhat popular articles. And it turns out that Y to Y is in them a lot. Um, for example, this ecosystem management as a wicked problem, uh, you know, is mentioned in there as an example of a large landscape solution. This is probably a conservative number because it's sort of uh, hard to find them all, but um, there aren't any other large landscape movements that we're aware of that have this kind of coverage, right? So that's a, that's a suggestion that maybe the idea is being mainstreamed. Another way we can look at it is the kinds of things that we're in. So here, this is uh, um, Gray's Anatomy. I love that they had our poster in the background. Um, this right here is the West Wing show. For those of you who are younger, you might not remember this show, but the West Wing show had a particular day they called the Wing Nut Day. And guess what they presented on that day? The Y to Y vision, right? And, and the trail of Pluey the wolf that I showed you earlier. And, um, and uh, yeah, it, it, it was quite something. And then all of these other uh, types of, this is a PBS Nova film that's won a lot of um, uh, awards, Canadian Geographic, uh, National Geographic from the US, et cetera, right? So the idea is getting out there. I do want to tell you a little bit about this West Wing show because it was presented as a wing nut idea ambitious, audacious, but is it doable, right? The very question that I'm asking today and that we're trying to kind of dive into. And for those of us who are scientists, um, we would hate that particular video because it actually had things like um, Pluey the Wolf going to Wyoming. You might have noticed that she didn't actually go to Wyoming in, in the actual data. It also had palm trees in the Rockies. But <laughs> For those of us that care more about the communication side of things, it was phenomenally effective. It got to a huge audience. It made a point, right? You can't be a perfectionist, I guess. Um, so one of the other things that I think is really neat is that Y2Y has actually helped to create other large landscape and seascapes movements. So in the case of the Alps to Atherton, we, you know, they were looking. It's now called the Great Eastern Ranges Corridor. Um, which sadly I just got a message the other day from a colleague there, significant chunks of that land have burned. It is really hard for them. They designed that corridor specifically for climate change and they're already overwhelmed by climate change. However, he ended on a high note that there is some new money to continue to uh, work on the connectivity side of things, but it's a hard time for them right now. So, um, But on the Baja de Bering, I was at the last World Conservation Congress, which was a few years ago, and I was just riding the shuttle to my hotel, and this woman was sitting next to me, and she said, you're from Yellowstone to Yukon, Y to Y? I'm from B to B, Baja de Bering. We want to be the marine equivalent of you. So we actually didn't give them any advice, but they went forward with it anyway. And there's other movements like uh, the two countries, one forest, are staying connected movement in the northern Appalachians just north of us that, again, was actually designed by some of the founders of Y to Y. So we know that this movement, that Y to Y is having an impact at different scales. So I think that those are some good indicators of how Y to Y, we can look at Y to Y's impact. However, there's these orange areas here that we're calling other conservation areas. They might be grizzly bear recovery, zones, roadless areas, other conservation, well actually any conservation easement, special management areas. They might be permanent, they might not. They're not um, protected areas, so we can't measure them in that way. And we actually haven't yet figured out how to um, measure sort of what we would call increases in the conservation value on, on broader landscapes, um, particularly when it might not be enduring. So if anyone is looking for a PhD topic, 
happy to chat about that. Uh, um, another, another challenge, which is sort of related, is we, um, we help get a lot of coexistence work going. This is a woman from Tom Miner's Basin, which is the first valley north of Yellowstone National Park. And I was there. I actually saw wolves chasing elk through a cow herd. It is a tough place to be a rancher. And that she, this person here is a range rider, and the idea is that a human presence on the landscape will deter those grizzly bears and those wolves. Well, we need more research to know if that's really true. There are a lot of different kinds of coexistence tools out there that are being employed. We actually don't know which ones work. Um, but also, we can't tell you how, how the individual efforts scale up and whether really what we're trying to do is have a cultural shift. In my vision, I would love it if the ranching and the urban communities and the rural communities that are sprawling everywhere could identify positively as living in the last sort of badass area of the West, living with those toothy animals that are hard to live with and living with pride. That, how do we know if we're making progress towards that? That's another dissertation right there. Come talk to me. Um, got another problem. So we're seeing, and I didn't show you the data, but what's really exciting is that grizzly bears are expanding. You might follow some of the whether grizzly bears should be delisted or not um, debates across the US. Um, but grizzly bears are expanding in a lot of places. But at the same time, this animal here, the caribou, has disappeared. Two years ago, the United States lost its last caribou. Okay, um, The population just north of there also went extinct. They're taking the last of the same gendered animals and put, moving them to a zoo to, re, you know, to, to um, uh, breed them, but there's no habitat to go back to. Um, up here in the Peace River region, this is where the new announcement for the indigenous protected area is going in to, to reverse the decline of caribou, but it's a rough story. We've got a long way to go because mountain caribou are only found in the Waidawai region. Um, and they're not doing well. So we've got work to do there. Um, uh, so the question was, why are caribou not doing well um, in the region? And they're mostly not doing well because oil and gas and logging. So um, caribou are old growth species. As soon as you create a linear um, disturbance, it allows for things like moose and other hoofed animals to get in there, which then brings carnivores. And and uh, caribou are not actually, they're quite naive about, about predators. And so um, as soon as there's openings in the forest, they're very susceptible to mountain lions. They're very susceptible to wolves. And so you can imagine what industry has done is then they, they say, OK, well, it's the, the wolf's fault. So we're going to aerially gun out the wolves. Um, but that's not a long-term solution. The long-term solution is to maintain the old growth and restore big enough chunks that caribou can live on their own. So let's go a little bit further south. You remember Yellowstone. It's that poor population of grizzly bears all by itself, not as genetically rich as the population north. Used to be they were about 150 miles apart. Now they're, depending on who you talk to, about 50 miles apart. My town of Bozeman, where I lived for 15 years, grew by 28% in 10 years. And it was not New York City style. It was Western style. They, everybody went out and they bought a piece of a river runs through it, right? Um, and the problem with that isn't that people don't have good intents. They love that place, right? But they are literally hardening the boundaries of protected areas and clogging potential corridors. So we have a time-limited opportunity to get it right. We think we can do it. Um, so we're working hard on taking the model from the cabinet Purcells that I told you about with those corridors and finishing the job with 12 more linkages in that area. Another challenge, you've seen this before. This is that overcross. Here's a sad story. Wolverines, most amazing, most ferocious animal, to be totally biased for a second, in, in uh, our region. It has uh, the, the strongest jaw ratio capacity. So watch out if you ever get to see it in the wild. You won't because it's too fast. But um, they, uh, it turns out that females don't appear to use overpasses. We haven't documented even one. So even though we've got this great technological fix on roads, 
it might not work for all critters. We are hopeful there's a new overpass going in in Yoho, which is in British Columbia, Yoho National Park, and it's kind of higher up and more remote. But what we think is happening is that these females are really sensitive to human activities and even highways, so they're not even getting close enough to even explore whether there's an overpass. So we'll see on that when the jury's out, but um, it might mean that these east-west roads, like the Trans-Canada Highway that goes through Banff here, uh, could just be barriers for them. Uh, all right, so why is connecting and reconnecting, why do I imp uh, important? Well, one, um, it allows for animals and plants, right, to move, um, especially during this time of climate change. And it ensures healthy ecosystems, right? Because many ecosystem processes operate at a scale beyond protected areas. And then um, I always like to remind people that there is actually an economic component to it. Nature, the nature-based economy, people visiting nature, was one of the only economies that didn't tank in Alberta over the last few years. It's a strong economy. If you look at Colorado, Salazar announced that he's trying to protect every single acre of land that he can because actually the economics show that maintaining green space is good for the Colorado economy. So with that, I hope I've given you a sense of what Wadawai is, how it relates to the global context of conservation, um, how it actually is making a difference to think at a large scale, uh, and uh, what some of the challenges and opportunities are going forward. Um, you know, and why will it work? It's because if you work in partnership using science and knowledge to guide, we think that it is making a difference across the landscape and it will continue to. So if you're really interested in this subject, I, can t I encourage you to look at, uh, watch the video, uh, Wild Ways, Quarters of Life. It is a PBS Nova film. It's available on Amazon, Netflix, and all those other things. And I love talking about corridors in particular, so you're welcome to read a book or talk to me. Uh, Any time later. And I will end there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have time for some questions, and I'll let yeah. you ask the question. Um, so, thank you so much for your presentation. And I noticed that you do work in both the US and Canada. Have you noticed differences in how you have to interact with those two governments and whether they work together well? Or Oh, absolutely. So the question is, do we interact uh, differently with the governments on either side of the border? So on the one level, no. The for world's first international peace park is Waterton Lakes and Glacier. And there, uh, that area and the larger area beyond is very much um, a, um, an area where we're seeking positive peace and working together on projects. Um, and so in that particular area, no. But really when it comes down to what's happening both at local government levels all the way up to federal government levels, it's really different. Um, um, just in terms of who has power. So um, in the US, we have the feds have power over most of those federal lands, right? The Forest Service land, the US Fish and Wildlife Service land, the BLM land. In Canada, the provinces are actually maintain the decisions over all the crown lands. And so just the way that we need to operate in order to work is very different in who we're working with. So, um, and, and, and uh, you know, and um, a lot of what we do in terms of actual change on the ground is really local and really it's about people. Um, so that remains the same. Yes? Yeah, so that the natural gas actually starts here, up here in the Peace River region, and is coming down. Um, I'm can't, I'm not very good with the map, but uh, the West Wetton, who are protesting that pipeline, the traditional people are um, approximately in this area over here. But is that is the province pushing it, or is it the, the national government that's pushing it in addition to the oil companies? So um, you know, th today is a really complex time, and and. Um, it's, that is a really interesting case study um, because um, so there are oil companies 
that worked with the federal government and the BC government, and they followed what's called the Indian Act. And they got 20 signatures from the heads or the counselors of those First Nations. Some of the heads of those, for the, some of the counselors are also hereditary chiefs or have been in the past. There are hereditary chiefs who don't want to see the pipeline go forward. And so there's division, and this is really common, within these indigenous nations. The MLA who, you know, who is, is having protesters coming into his office, and I think they cordoned him off at one point. Um, I'm not sure exactly, but he's, he's indigenous um, from that area. And, and so this is an example of, it's a really, really complicated issue of how to, how to move forward when there's, a, there's no clarity, basically, on who owns the land, right? Because British Columbia is one of the only, uh, well, is, is, uh, they did not settle treaty with most First Nations. They have been asked by the federal government to do so. Um, but this is part of the dilemma, is that nobody agrees on whose land that is. Um, and it creates this incredibly messy, really complex environment, um, which, as you can tell, is at a standstill right now. Yeah, it's a really tough circumstance. Yes? Can you say something about the funding model? You mentioned at some point giving $8 million of your money to leverage having $40 million of somebody else's money. Yes. So um, that's on, on land purchases, which are obviously are, are, uh, conservation easement. And so um, you know, from Y to Y, ourselves, we raise private money, so foundations and individual dollars, right? Um, when we work with land trusts, they often have access to other pots of money. It might be federal dollars or state dollars that can help support that. Um, but they need private match, and that's where we can come in. Um, and we can agree to, we're only, you know, we're quite disciplined about, we are only buying these lands. Whereas land trusts have to be a little bit more opportunistic. Um, and so we find a really healthy intersection there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you talked a lot about wild mammals and how they've changed. And obviously they're charismatic and kind of yeah. easier to track. But I'm just wondering um, if you know about what's happened in other taxonomic groups throughout the world. <coughs> Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I, I had to choose, and they are, we call them sexy, actually. I was um, <laughs> um, but there are, we, we have supported a number of projects. For example, um, uh, there's an amazing migration of golden eagles, the largest uh, bird, and right close to where I live, sometimes you can see 100 golden eagles in an hour just catching the, the wind over one of the passes. It's really true, the uplift. <laughs> it's incredible. Um, and we know that birds are changing significantly. So for example, their arrival time, if especially in the further north regions like the Arctic and subarctic, is um, our research from the Arctic shows about two weeks. They're arriving two weeks earlier than they did before. And so we risk all this uh, desynchronization of, of process. Um, you know, certainly people are looking at things like trees. So we know trees are marching up. Um, and there are efforts, um, like the Wildlife Conservation Society, when I was there, we started uh, supporting some efforts which are planting, where they're using plantations. They're actually planting trees that they expect will be better uh, suited for that habitat, so moving them out of their former range and into new range. Um, uh, so we're seeing a lot of these different kinds of changes happen across the system. Our hope is, is that because Y2Y is a north-south mountain range, that if we can in, get it adequately protected and connected, that animals can move north-south, but they can also move up. They can change slope, aspect, elevation, all of that stuff, um, which makes it much more robust. You know, if you're a butterfly and you're in the Great Plains, you know, and you have a limited flight movement, it's much harder to move north, um, whereas a butterfly in the Rockies has a lot more options. Thank you very much. With that, we'll um, bring it to a close, but folks uh, can come up and chat with Jody afterwards. Jody, thank you so much. Thank you.